speaker internazionale di origini sudafricane. Ha lavorato nelle Nazioni Unite, dove si è occupata anche dei programmi radio anti-apartheid. È con noi con grande onore, è venuta dal Sudafrica per il Dreamers Day, Sindiwe Magona, accompagnata da Papa Baden, che la intervisterà. Che meraviglia, che meraviglia, ma che scemo vedi però, però, e mi vergogno un po' perché non so più fare oh, non so più andare sull'altalena di un fil di lana, non so più fare una colata. The trouble with growing up in a depressed area is that that's all you see, that's all you know. And dreams like madness are culture-based. You cannot dream of anything better when you don't know, you haven't seen, you have no experience of such. Nobody tells you you are not worth having that, but you don't see anybody who looks like you who has it. Why would you dream of having that? Because she was very open to us. She was a person that you could tell her your stories. Sometimes she was a counselor, a mother, and also a teacher. Thank you, Mom Cindy, and your team. We really appreciate the things that you did for us. Thank you. I know people say people are not perfect, but to us, she's perfect. She's our hero. Mama Cindy is like a mother. Mama Cindy is a very kind woman. And she was telling us about the way she grew up and she was encouraging us. Mom Cindy always used to say that mistakes are proof that you are trying and that every child is a flower that is gardening our world. Greatness is in all of us. It just needs to be rekindled when it's being stumped and, and, and extinguished by hardship and poverty. It's there. So, Sindiwe, reclaiming or ending poverty is uh, a difficult task. It's a large task. Um, do you think, according to you, um, what do you do on a daily basis to, do, to end poverty? Mine is an easy task. Because um, when I look at people, young people especially, who live in poverty, this is South Africa today, there is filthy wealth and just filth and poverty. I can easily say to young people, if we were to have a competition today about poverty, I am certain I would win hands down because I grew up poor, but I didn't know that. I discovered poverty as a young adult. When I was 23, my life was over. It was in, in, the, in the toilet bin. You just needed to flush. Book two of my autobiography is called Forced to Grow. And it starts with the sentence, I was a has-been at the age of 23. 23, I had no life. Then I can say, look at me today. Do I look like a has-been? And the answer is always, no. And then I say, I can show you the way out of poverty. Poverty is not an incurable disease. Poverty is escapable. You must hate it enough that you are prepared to do every legal thing to get out. Once you discover agency, there is lots of help along the way. 
I didn't do it alone. But I reached a moment in my life when I looked. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had condemned everything and everybody. The apartheid government, the husband who abandoned me, society who would laugh. And, but then I realized all these entities didn't care what I thought. My condemning them, my being angry, didn't matter. They didn't even know I breathed. It was up to me to change my life. Up to me. Once I started, I discovered how much help there is when you start doing. And this is what I wish for everybody. Because the joy that comes of a transformed life is a gift not only to the person. It's a gift to your family, to your community, and to others you don't know. Because they look at you and they think, if she could do it, maybe so can I. That's the gift of my life. Thank you. So... Thank you. Could you tell us a bit more about the Sparkle Kids project that you're involved in and what it meant by uh, the, the mission of giving the children a day without violence, fear, or poverty? Well, the thing is, I always had this big mouth and little else. My only gift <laughs> is the gift of words. And uh, when I retired from the UN, I chose to go back to South Africa because I believe that post-apartheid, everybody would, would want to work for transformation because I knew that 1994 uh, wouldn't change anything for people who lived in poverty. Political change is not social change. And now, five years ago, I... I got an invitation. I was stolen. <laughs> People came to me in Cape Town. I, I live in Cape Town. My home is in Cape Town. What you saw on the screen is Hermanus, which is an hour and a half away from Cape Town. Until 1994, Hermanus didn't have any people who looked like me. It was a seaside resort for filthy rich white people. Now they have about 30 million black, black South Africans, and they don't know what has hit them. Hermanas had one high school for white kids, no jail, no police station, no railway station. No need for that when you all have cars. But now there is Hermanas, and there is the other Hermanas. And a family, white, Africana, not rich woke up to this reality and they started something called Sparkle Kids. They saw what was happening in the new high school for black kids where the pass rate five years, six years ago was 32%. The other high school had 100% with 90% of those kids getting distinctions. And Theo Crano went to the principal of the black school. Can we help? Help with what? The principal had no idea he had a problem. Uh, 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 help with your kids. What's wrong with my kids? Uh, 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 the performance. No, we had 32%. We're not doing badly. Two provinces out of the nine in South Africa had 0% passes. So this principal thought he was doing well. But Theo persisted until eventually he was allowed to come and help. He gets other people from Hermanas, retired professionals, to help the kids in math, in science, in English, in this and that. And gradually, every year, the results at the black high school improve from 30 to 40. Last year, there were 90 something past, no, 86, 86 percent. With a lot of those people able to go to tertiary. So there's been improvement. But they realize that they need to start earlier. They need to start at the, at, the, at the primary school. And also because of South Africa and our history of race hate, there are things they cannot say because they are white. 
they can say it's wrong of you to have children because they will be accused of racism. They need a Cindy Makona who, who doesn't know when to zip her lips. But also, when I speak truth, whether it's truth to power or truth to poverty, I have the authenticity and courage or stupidity to say my truth. So I can say to young people, it's not right to bring children into poverty. If you are a young person, why don't you start with enabling yourself to look after a human being called a child before you go and get the child? That kind of thing a white person can say to a black kid. Not in South Africa, not even today. So that's what I do. I work with young people to just give themselves a sense of their respect for self. That's where it starts. Respect for the other. It doesn't matter what the other looks like. We are all one. And respect for the environment. And then there are exercises, and then there are games, and then there is fun. But the kids learn. The kids are ready. They are waiting for people called grown-ups to nurture them, to encourage them, so that they can rediscover the hope with which they were born and the gifts they come bearing to the world. Every child comes to the world with their hands tightly fisted. In those tiny hands are the gifts we call talents that they bring to us. But they need us to nurture those gifts to fruition. No nurturing, no, no Miriam Makeba. No nurturing, no Nelson Mandela. No kid is going to sing like the kids who open this event if they are growing up in poverty and nobody discovers them and takes them out and nurtures them so they find the gift inside them. You don't have to give them anything. Help them rediscover themselves and grow themselves to maturity so they can give back to the environment, to society, what they already have. I can't give them gifts, they have them. I can help them rediscover those gifts. I came to my life by accident. I used those accidents as steps out of poverty. So you've mentioned to us one of the philosophies that you have about respecting other people, races, and the environment. I'd like you to talk a bit about two others of your philosophies, about owning your mistakes, and about teaching the youth to dream. You, you're not human if you don't make mistakes. I start with my own life, and I say, this is not... And an example I want you to follow. My being a has been at 23 is that there I was 23 years old, big bellied with a baby. This is not baby number one. It's not baby number two either. All my children were oops babies. Oops, I'm pregnant. Oops, I'm pregnant. Three times. Then I say, today you have better facilities. You don't fall pregnant by accident. Nobody does. Don't bring children into the world when you can hardly feed yourself. But until you own up to your own mistakes, you will not find a way out of those mistakes. Today people ask me, how did you become you? And I can say with all honesty, I was very lucky. When I was 23, I was dumped by a man. If that man had not walked away from me, I wouldn't be here today. Poverty has no middle age. All youth is beautiful. You look at young people in South Africa who are black. They are blooming. They are glowing. 
They are newlyweds. You can see from the dresses they, they wear. Ten years they are in their 30s. Give them another five. They start looking gaunt and old. Very few people who were born the same year like me are 76 like I am and look like me. I was never beautiful as a child, a young person. But I look at my body and myself and my health. I grew up when we didn't go to the doctor unless somebody was almost dead. Because it was such a nuisance calling a doctor to your, to your, to your shack. You had to go and borrow the bed sheets from somebody you knew who had sheets. You had to scrub your floor so the doctor didn't come in and say, no wonder you are sick, look at the filth you live in. Today, every year, I go to the doctor at least once. Not because I'm sick. It's called my annual health checkup. Annual checkup. <laughs> This is a life I wish for everybody in South Africa. Because if we transform the poor, we will have less fear in the country, less anger in the country, fighting poverty and winning the war will benefit all South Africans. That's why I am here with this big dream to have a house of reprieve. Where we can gather children from the poor entities so that for a weekend or a week or a month a child can get respite, a break from the hell that is her daily life. Never enough to eat. Never a, a, a space where you can wash yourself. Never a moment of silence. Never to know silence. Never freedom from abuse. How can these children dream? Dream about what? Dreams are like madness. When I dream and my white counterpart dreams, it doesn't matter how close we are as friends. We cannot see the same things in our hallucinations. My hallucinations are culture-based. And so are hers. Children growing up in poverty are not going to dream of better lives. They don't know what a better life means. Where will they see this better life? I dream for the children that they discover normalcy. What is a normal day? What can I become? Every child is born as a gift to the world. If we can help them to reach adulthood, with those dreams inside them coming out and nurtured, we cannot but win the war against poverty. It is there. If I, go, I could do it during apartheid, it is definitely possible now. 
is waiting for me and you and the children. Thank you. Thank you, Sindiwa. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you for having me here.